Unified School District in order at 6.03. Today is 3 January 2018. We're at the central office. We have nine directors present, two electronically, uh, representing eight votes. So start with the agenda review. Uh, there's one item that I'd like to add, item 6A under old business. Um, that'll be building purchase, discussion on that. Um, we'll start that in open session, and um, if we need to, we'll, we'll go into a next session on that, but I don't think we'll need to. Um, anything else anyone would like to add to the agenda before we start? Great, then I'd look for a motion to accept the agenda as modified. So moved. Right. Second. I'll no second. Thanks, Steve. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Extensions? 8-0. Good, I'd ask everybody to please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, great. We'll start uh, with the visitor section tonight. Is there anybody? Beth Oregon. Hi, I'm Beth Oregon. I'm from Fairfield. I'm a community member, and I'm a teacher. Um, we are aware that you're going to begin your principal search um, very soon. So we have put together a letter that is going around the community and has some signatures at this point to encourage you to keep Dr. Odell as our principal. Um, we're very pleased. We have a, I think, a very well written letter here, and we would like to give you this as a beginning. But knowing full well that we have many copies out in the community, it's been vacation, and we would like until the 17th to gather more signatures and then present it to you at that time formally. But I would like to give this to Mr. Barr. Okay, that's great. Um, <coughs> so you're aware that it's out there. So, and just so I understand, this is to forego a principal search? Um, either way, if you choose to do the principal search, we want you to know that we really would like you to consider the candidacy of Dr. Odell. And if you opt out, we would be delighted if you hired him. Okay, so if, you, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Okay, sure. Sure. Thank you. So, we, the undersigned community members of Fairfield, Vermont, are submitting this letter as aff affirmation of our unified, strong, and vigorous support for acting principal Dr. Sean O'Dell's candid candidacy as permanent principal of Fairfield Center School. We respectfully ask that you take our support for Dr. O'Dell in strong consideration in the selection process. Last year, when Dr. O'Dell was appointed interim principal at FCS, he immediately got to work building relationships with students, parents, teachers, and staff and through his stellar leadership cultivated an atmosphere of stability, caring, effective problem solving, and excellence that enabled our school to get back on the right track. During his time with us, Dr. O'Dell has demonstrated without fail that he is the best and right leader for Fairfield Center School. Should the board decide to have a formal principal search, we want to make sure that you are aware of our support for Dr. O'Dell's candidacy. We would be delighted if the board chose to opt out of a formal principal search and hire Dr. O'Dell to be the permanent principal of our beloved school so that he can continue to lead us in being a dedicated institution of learning and a vibrant community of mutual support. Respectfully, and then there's the signatures here. Um, <clears throat> this is great. Um, Very well written. It is a well written letter. Um, and I would just, I would just point out, um, Statute requires that the board hires a principal at the rec recommendation of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So um, with this in mind, I, I would ask that the superintendent have conversations with Dr. O'Dell over the next two weeks. And then we put a, a, an agenda item on next, the next meeting at this, on the 17th, which uh, coincidentally is at Fairfield, um, to have a, a, principal dis a discussion <coughs> on the principal action. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other visitors? Okay, we'll move to the consent agenda then. On the consent agenda, our approval of minutes of 20 December and the media packets, which is uh, attachment 5B in our package. 
Uh, are there any reason to pull any of those items from the consent agenda to discuss? If there's no objections, these items will be um, accepted. I don't see any. Consent agenda is accepted. Item 6A, old business, building purchase. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll start it, and uh, Martha will tag team with me and actually do most of the talking. We, uh, as you know, we had planned on having the building purchase done in early January. And we're still somewhat hoping for that, but we did run into one wrinkle, which I'll let Martha explain better than I, but it has to do with um, some some taxes that will quarterly taxes that will be owed on the property, and from there I'll let Martha go and explain that. And I'm no expert on property taxes. <coughs> All information that we've gotten through our attorney and working with the um, lister at the city. So basically, property taxes are um, assessed, the grand list is assessed on April 1 for taxes that become due starting July 1 through the following June. This property that we're talking about on April 1st of 2017 on the grand list is um, assessed as a commercial property, taxable commercial property. There are two tax installments that will be due, one in February and one in May, of about um, slightly over $2,500 each. And that property tax is going to become payable regardless if, um, if we purchase the property or not. Those payments have to be made. If we purchase the property, they become our responsibility, depending on the date of the purchase. We argued that we are a school district and we are tax exempt. And um, based on the information from the attorneys, um, it has to follow, it's, it has to do with the legislature that all towns set their grand list as of April 1st. And that once it's set, it can't be changed until the next April 1st. And so, with us purchasing this property, those taxes are still going to be due. Conversations with the landlord, um, he is not willing to make those property taxes if we make the, if we purchase the property. Um, <coughs> and we wanna purchase the property prior to April 1st because if we wait till after April 1st, <laughs> we will have another year's worth of property taxes that will be owed on this building. Okay. So, so to start the discussion going, then I can get a motion to <coughs> pay the due taxes um, when they're due. Yes. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Marcia? Martha? So it's going to have, we're just getting caught in the transition. Right. But afterwards, we'll qualify for the exemption. Correct. Okay. Okay. Right. And have the money to do it. The taxes. Where's the money coming from? It will have to come from our current year budget. Yeah. And it's roughly five thousand dollars. Yes. It's, uh, so here's my frustration. Five thousand. We we had a special vote in order to try to do this before <coughs> town meeting day. And guess what's happening? We're not going to purchase it till after town meeting day, and we're not going to have saved the the invest the equity. Well, here's the difference, though. Had we waited for town meeting day, we certainly wouldn't have purchased it before April 1st, and then we would have been looking at an entire year's worth of taxes. Did I hear that right? Correct. And I'd also and say that depending on what the board decides tonight, there's no need to wait till March 7th right. to finalize it. You can do it tomorrow. Within the week. Um, well, it's kind of split in the hair whether we would have or would have not been faced with a year's worth of taxes, right? Because town meeting day is March 3rd. Mm -hmm. so March. But closing time between that time and April 1st would be difficult on a property. So it would. I think what they're saying is it would have been after April 1st anyway, and we still would have got to with those taxes. Yeah. 
Um, clearly, nobody saw this. <coughs> it caught us by surprise. Yeah. We're still getting a wonderful deal. Yep, yeah, we are. I agree. It's just a frustration. <laughs> You're not, alone. Of, You're not alone. I mean, we put steps in place to try to, you know, make something better. Better. <laughs> and we still have. It's a wrinkle. Anybody else? <coughs> Al, Jack, anything? No, that yep, sounds good to me. Be great. Okay. So, any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, we have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, approve date zero. Go buy a building. <laughs> Okay, new business, audit acceptance. Martha, we're going to hear a lot from you tonight. Yeah, it's going to be a Martha, Martha show tonight, I'm afraid. <laughs> so you have in front of you, each one of you, a stack of the audits that you are going to accept this evening, I hope. Um, they, we ended up with a uh, clean audit in, in every instance. Um, there is one um, management uh, suggestion or um, issue, and it's with Collins Pearly, and it's the one we've had in multiple years, and we're still working on trying to figure out the best way to, to manage the, the, the issue, which is uh, membership fees and, and recording them. But we are working towards a solution on that. Other than that, they were all um, pretty clean. So did they? Still do separate audits on each facility? I thought it was going to be one audit for the whole district. For FY18, it will be one audit. Ah, These are FY17 <laughs> audits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to get a book this thick now. Hopefully, you'll get one book that will be half that big. <laughs> okay, look for a motion to uh, accept these six audits. So move. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion on those? Further questions for Martha? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Thought it's accepted 8 0. Item 7B proposed upgrades to Colin Pearly Field. This is attachment 7B, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Kimmel. Thank you. The packet includes background information and a request from the College Poly Board of Directors that I'm representing. Um, I have here a visual of what um, one of the projects, the major larger of the projects, will look like. Anybody interested? I also have, for anyone that doesn't have a computer, a written copy of the background information that's in this packet. Oh, mm -hmm. do have a computer, so it's small. Yeah. Anybody else to see the copy of this? <coughs> Without being too redundant from what you've been provided, um, in summary, the calls probably have been looking at for some time at what they envision as the current and future needs to satisfy both um, Bell Free Academy, the district in general, and to a lesser degree, the community at large. Um, the agreement between BFA, now Maple Run, and the Collins Pearly Board, under which the um, management of the facility operates, makes it clear that um, the Collins Pearly Board doesn't have the authority to do anything like this without approval from the Maple Run Board. Um, so if the um, Collins Proley Board is to move forward in any way, shape, or form, it really requires um, action by, by your group. Um, there are basically three projects. One is to convert what's generally referred to as the upper lacrosse field. That's the field closest to uh, Jolly's um, store. 
to an artificial turf surface. There would be um, some stadium bleacher type seating and there would be lights that would allow uh, games to be done at night. There would also be a small snack bar with bathroom facilities um, since it's quite a separation from there to an entrance to the main building. The second project is uh, to do the infield of the baseball field, also with artificial turf. And the third project is to upgrade five of our other fields with um, better drainage and improving the topography. The primary concern uh, with regards to the um, field that we want to put artificial turf in is uh, lacrosse rarely gets on the field until after they've had their first game. Um, spring weather conditions are just such that that's the case and frankly usually they're playing at another field that also has artificial turf because most of the uh, schools are in the same position. If they have natural turf, they don't get on their field from time. Um, there also are a lot of problems with spring sports in general on that kind of field because once the frost is gone, uh, they say uh, April showers bring May flowers and there's plenty of showers and um, that really causes a safety concern when you get to the high school level and you're going to have fields that are dug up and, and a concern about uh, sprains and, and uh, slip and fall type injuries to knees and ankles and hips and so on. Um, the Collins Pearly Board feels quite strongly that by putting this field in, it will provide some equity between the sports where um, really the cross gets a little bit short end of the stick, I guess. But beyond that, um, it's just not possible to play lacrosse on the stadium field because of the amount of damage that's done to particular areas. Uh, so lacrosse never gets to have a game under the lights. We also feel that the, these fields will be heavily used for games uh, for soccer, which gives them the opportunity to play under the lights. Now each team plays two games under the lights per year. And that pretty much maxes out the stadium field for two reasons. One, wear and tear, and secondly, with um, the number of soccer and boys soccer, girls soccer, and football teams and games and practices, there just isn't enough time on the field to have more than that. Um, so again, that provides some equity between sports and giving soccer an opportunity to play under the lights. Um, while this is a school facility and we primarily look at school needs, I, I think that this district board has always been uh, very aware of the need and desire to serve the community at large. I see a strong likelihood that programs like Steeler Football and Phantoms across the youth sports programs will use these fields uh, quite heavily in the off season for BFA. The um, baseball field unfortunately was built with a significant grade from the outfield to the infield, so all the surface water runs to the infield. There is a pretty significant uh, swale just behind the infield that is designed to carry some of that water away, but um, even in spite of putting in drainage in the outfield and doing some other things, it's, it's really tough to keep the water from following its natural course. You combine that with the fact that the original field, of course, was put in in 1985 and hasn't had significant work done to it since then. That's some work, but not significant work. All the subfield drainage is basically useless at this point. At the very least, the infield needs to be dug up and down to uh, probably 18 inches, depending on what we find, and basically put a whole new infield in there. Um, they say if you get 20 years out of an infield, you're doing great. Where I think that makes us 32 years at this point. Um, I feel from my research that um, the long term benefits to putting artificial turf in the infield are, are tremendous. Um, that's the only full size baseball field in St. Albans City or town. So the feeder programs for baseball depend on it as soon as the BFA season's over, uh, Babe Ruth and the other Legion teams and all those teams come in, as do even some adult leagues. 
when the field is busy through the whole summer, so there's really never a time that we have any downtime on that field that we can do regular repairs and maintenance. Um, by putting in the artificial turf field, uh, we'll be able to run that field from early, early in the spring right through into fall and uh, serve the community very well. Um, for those who might be curious, the artificial turf, the way it's done today in baseball fields, does not dig out the areas around the bases and home plate um, to put clay in that could be on, like they used to do in the old days, it's artificial turf the whole way, uh, even around the bases, although slightly different at home plate, the only clay would be on the pitcher's mound, which was so done the old-fashioned way. And then the final thing, uh, Project 3 is um, really all of our fields are past their useful life in terms of, of being able to be kept safe. Um, we have that's basically two fields across from the stadium field. We call those our practice fields. Uh, drainage is absolutely terrible in those. Um, we often are concerned about the risk of, of uh, ankles twisting and so on and so forth, even though we roll it about every other week at this point, which is bad for the grass, but a little bit safer. Um, both soccer fields are in need of, of um, drainage and crowning. And what's referred to as the lower lacrosse field, the lacrosse practice field, is um, not much better than a, a hay pasture or a cow pasture. It really has never had significant work done to it. So we feel from a safety standpoint those should all be done. The reality is if we put the artificial turf field in as proposed, there won't be as much need for those fields, but there still will be need for the fields when you consider the number of teams that we have. And, and I think the time has come that we take a real close look at the safety issues associated with um, having those fields go <coughs> so long without major overhauls. The um, projects combined are broken down for you, and you can see the total cost is a little over $3 million. The Collins Pearly Board is hopeful that this board will enthusiastically support this plan. We understand that there is no immediate plan for the board to do any bonding or do any other major projects at this time. But we would hope that if the time comes that you are doing a major project that includes bonding, you keep this project in mind for possible inclusion in that. In the meantime, however, we look at the fact that uh, Mr. Collins and Mrs. Pearley contributed to the facility we're in, that Holden Park was a gift, that Aldous Hill was a gift, um, and it goes on and on, the original Coop Field and, and so on, and we know the people of this area are very, very generous. We think that there's a possibility that if this board uh, is very much in support of the project to serve both the school and the community, uh, that we might have a chance that um, some philanthropic person or persons might step forward and help to fund all of our of it. So we're not asking for money to be clear, we're asking for support and the authority to seek financial support from the community. Okay, can I ask a question? Thank you. Al, as, uh, as our representative on the uh, Collins Pearly Board of Directors, is there anything else you want to add? Well, I just want to just reflect back that uh, these improvements or additions are certainly in keeping with the fact that we have been growing over the uh, past several years. I mean, we've added lacrosse, we've added uh, a lot of activities, and now we're looking at to put us in the same position as we would be uh, for. Uh, football and some of the other sports, baseball and all. And we need improvements. And this, this certainly is uh, within the realm of uh, uh, doability. And uh, hopefully it'll be looked on as favorably. Okay. So Dave's been nice enough to write a motion for us. So if we could get it all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I just had a question on the timeline. That's something we can start right away. Do you need it done by next fall? Or all these three projects or four projects? Well, the, the biggest question is when we'll be able to get the funding. If someone stepped forward with a check today, 
I think probably we'll be looking at construction not this summer but the following summer. We'll have to do either bids or request for proposal or to have some permitting issues. There's there's no way it would be done this for this summer and be ready for either this fall or next spring. It would be the following summer project. It, in the best case scenario. And, and so funding is outside of this budget or we would be looking for private funding in the community that has nothing to do with the school budget. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so Dave I'm I'm still kind of learning how these two boards interact with each other and how this works. So we have a motion to approve this project as slated here at the three point two million dollar mark. Does that approve this up to that dollar amount or what if you know we get chugging along and, and say, yeah, geez, it's a lot more than we thought it was gonna be. Um, do you, does it come back to this board or are we saying the board approved the project? Well, I think that that's a, a question that's based more on practice than, than our agreement. Mm -hmm. But I think if you approve conceptually and we come up, we the Collins Pearly Board comes up with the money, whether it's more or less than this, unless there's a significant change in the concept, I wouldn't expect that we would need to come back to the board, to this board. Mm -hmm. But certainly, we will be informed every step of the way as we go through the process, and it will be a fairly slow process. So any time that this board wanted to step in and take whatever degree of control or oversight that they'd like to, you'll have the opportunity. Fair enough. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. I notice um, just south of the um, a lacrosse field, what is currently green space, I think they play volleyball there in archery sometimes. A show is that a, a parking area now? That is proposed as additional parking. Yes, proposed as additional parking. And the loss of use of that for what is currently used is seen as not a big deal. You can put those nets up elsewhere. I gather that. Or yeah, very good point. Yes, we're we're not concerned about putting those in another place. Um, it's a small space that doesn't get a lot of use. But frankly, the use it gets is important. Yeah. It will fit in other areas. Mm -hmm. I think this light right here is pointing right into your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so Sounds good. Sorry. Well, the lights, by the way, will be lower than what you have for a football field. We envision having them lower, and, and the lights today do not, it is a good question, do not create as much uh, glare beyond the field. They can be directed very much better than they used to be. Um, by having lower lights, we would not be able to have night football games. All the other sports would, uh, would be fine, but if there was a problem with the stadium field for some reason, we could always play a football game on a Saturday or you know, Friday afternoon or something like that. Okay. Thank you. I have a quick question. Do you, is there an estimated cost of what it would take to maintain once this is built each year? What would the yearly maintenance cost be? The, um, an artificial turf field costs about the same to maintain <coughs> As a what? As a natural turf. Oh, okay. You do, it, a lot depends on what you what you do with it. If you put the lines in advance, obviously you don't have to paint them. Mm -hmm. But if we then ever had to paint them for football, we'd have to do that. But the money we save on things like painting and fertilizing and um, herbicides and mowing eventually gets eaten out by the fact that you still have to groom the field, probably with the amount of use we'd have weekly. And over the course of time, you do lose some of the crumb rubber that, that you know, is the infield that gets in the cuffs of people's pants and uh, that type of thing. Um, the reality is we'd save some, but I, I don't like to push the savings as being significant. The thing that, that is important for you to understand, for everybody to understand, is one of the reasons I haven't been a big proponent of artificial turf fields is 15 years from now, if that needs to be replaced, it needs to be replaced. 15 years from now, if you don't give me any money for fertilizer or seed or anything for the, for the stadium field, we could plant dirt. I hope we never get to that, but that is, to me, the one major downfall of an artificial turf field. You are kind of pinning yourself into uh, a replacement cost in approximately 15 years. You said other leads play it, like Steelers or whatever. But do do uh, teams or leads get charged to use the field, or Collins Pro Leagues? How does that work? 
I would envision, um, as well, teams now that are not related to the school. Yeah. For example, Babe Ruth Baseball pays a fee. That's right. Okay. And we would have a fee. Typically, the fee is designed to cover costs with, with oh, no good. profit. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. And what happened to the indoor pool? Did you have a question? Yeah. Next meeting. Yeah. Next meeting. May I address that? Because oh, since, okay. since this is going to be broadcast, it, it is a, a question a lot of people have. The, the liability of indoor pools for schools is enormous. Um, I know of several schools that have put pools in that regret it. Um, I know there's a lot of people in this community that would love to have it. In fact, the original Collins Per Wood design included a pool. I saw the drawings. I'd love to see them. They're very pretty. <laughs> but it, it just is not deemed to be practical by the Collins Per Wood board. Well, Steve's volunteering to put that in back. <laughs> so I'm having trouble finding the motion here. And what I want to know, does the motion limit the money raised to, uh, the money allowed to be spent to the 3200000 or if you raise more money, you can use that money above and beyond, or you have to come back and ask permission? The motion does not limit the money as, as it was intended. And I think what would happen there is if, for example, we had a benefactor that said, look, I, I want to do this, but I, I want the grandstand to be twice as big. I want this. I want that. Um, we're probably not going to turn that down. But again, this board will be kept very much aware of every step that we take. And it, it, I just don't want to pass a motion that ties your hands. That's all. And um, Jim said there's a motion here, but. It's on, it's on, yeah. the, it's on the second, on the second page. page. Thank right you. Right over Dave's signature. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead, Emma. Once you put in artificial turf, you're committed to it forever? Well, um, you can take it out, but um, <coughs> it will wear out. So. Um, but you can it, see, it, I mean, you're not, you're, you can see back if you wanted to underneath it, if you took it out. If you took the artificial turf out, you could put dirt down and you could see it. And you'd have a better base than you had beforehand. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is possible, but. Right, practical no, but possible yes, I guess. Right. Thank you. Can we read the motion into the meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I haven't been able to locate it, so that's why I'm asking. I have it, but I lost it. It's right here. It's on page two. Okay. I'll read it. From what he handed out or whatever. Oh, the whereas yeah. part yeah. is the motion. Yeah. Oh, I see it. Whereas the Collins Curly Sports Center, Inc. Board of Directors have studied the needs of Bellows Free Academy and the community and have developed a plan for field improvements dated December 13, 2017. And whereas the proposal is for plan approval without funding and understanding the Collins Curly Board of Directors will be seeking funding from outside of the school system. Now, therefore, the Maple Run Unified School District Board of Directors hereby approves of said plan as follows. And then there's uh, artificial turf or on the cross game field with lights and bleachers, $2,300,000. $2, Snack bar and bathroom at lacrosse field, uh, $200,000. Artificial turf or improved drainage to infields of baseball field, $200,000. Upgrade five fields with drainage and crowns. Lower lacrosse, varsity soccer, JV soccer at stadium practice, $500,000 for a total of $3,200,000. I'll make that motion. <laughs> I'll second. I think actually Al made the motion. Oh, Al made that motion. I'll second it. I'll third it. Whatever. Okay, no, that's fine. I don't care. Sorry, I don't care. Already on the floor. Yes, you're right, Al. Sorry, Al. There is a there is a motion on the floor. I had just requested to get read into the minutes. Sorry. So Milda just read it into the minutes. So did they pick up who seconded the motion, Al? I did. Thank you. Sorry. Al made the motion. Mike seconded it. Any further discussion? Any questions? Just when I read this motion, it, it, I just want to make sure your hands aren't tied with the money. It's, can somebody read that motion and just reassure me that if he goes over, if you go over two hundred thousand dollars for the snack bar or something, that 
that's okay. Does anyone else see that, the way the motion's written, why that might be a concern? I understand your concern. Yeah. Because we're listing we're listing numbers in the motion. I think that because we're not spending city uh, taxpayer money, I don't think it's a, as big a deal. Right? It's not our money. Right. Yeah, but we're telling him how much. No. Well, that's I mean those are estimates. Maybe okay. an amendment to the motion could read hereby approves the said plan with um, approximate costs as follows. Okay or estimated cost as follows, that therefore doesn't list them as certain. Did you hear that, Al? No, I did. So Dave is suggesting that we amend the motion uh, basically to say that these numbers here are estimates. I'm sorry, come back at me, I'm still not understanding. So Dave is recommending that we amend this motion to say that the dollar figures in this motion, in this plan, are estimates only. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so you're good with that amendment? I am. Mike? Second. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? So we should vote on the amendment and then vote on the motion as amended. Okay, thank you, Al. Any discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Amendment is approved. Any further discussion on the motion, the amended motion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, it's approved date zero. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Okay, that brings us to item C, which is a bid award for installing a PA system at Fairfield <coughs> Center School and the Common School. Attachment 7C. Is this you, Marcia? Yes. <laughs> so, with uh, Fairfield's um, lockdown procedures, they um, came upon the issue that there are areas in the common school and the and the central school that um, are not. How do I want to word that? Um, they can't be heard when there's a, a lockdown situation. So it's a safety issue. So we put out an RFP to um, get a PA system that would be. Uh, bring the both buildings into compliance as far as being able to um, notify all students and staff of lockdown issues. And we have two bids that came in for our, our RFP. One is from CTI Communication Technologies and the second was from First Choice. Um, the total bid for First Choice was 44000 the total bid for CTI was 61381 The recommendation is going to go, is for us to go with the CTI bid. And the difference being that the CTI bid included the cost of the trenching and the cabling to the common school, which the first choice um, bid did not include that cost. When you take that piece out of the, the bid packet to make it comparable, um, CTI came in a couple of about six thousand dollars less than the first choice bid. All right, so you're looking for a motion then to approve the bid for CTI? For the sixty-one thousand three eighty-one. Can I get a motion for that? Sure. Okay. Just curious. So why did um, let's, let's first go, choice let's not do a motion? First. First. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Mike. I'll second. Thank you. I was just wondering why um, First Choice didn't include that. Was, were they not expected to, or no? Um, they just uh, opted not to not to provide that service. So we would have to contract <coughs> that out. somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And right what's, what's the five thousand dollars in the uh, First Choice bid that, for the outside plant cost? Uh, I think it has to do with the uh, the, the actual wiring. So there was some costs for the connection, but not the trenching and the conduit costs. But the 5,000 is the 
cabling, the so it wiring. Looks like, looks like CTI is like forty-five dollars a drop cheaper mm -hmm. on the on the uh, Cat six cabling. <coughs> the paging is is that the internet? Is that what AIP means? Don't know. And is the conduit, is it going to be set so they could add cable to it later? Or is that even going to come up? Or if you wanted to add more cable to the common school? I would assume so, yes. Yeah, okay. And it's been coordinated with the town because the town owns the common fields and, and the common school. Actually, we have not contacted the town. We okay. will contact them before we make any adjustments. I, I Although we have to. We have to maintain that building. I, I, I know all that, but what I'm only mentioning is because when we dug the uh, nature trail, we stumbled upon an old septic tank, which had to be filled. And so there might be some things in the way. It might be wise to go around some of the other things, and that's my only suggestion, which is really not pertinent to the, right. to the motion. But. No, I'm just curious what you filled the septic tank with. Well, I think it was where the common school used to be. Sorry, that, I a joke. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean now what we filled it with? Eh? Quick question, common school, is, is it the white? The is white, that white? The yes. white building. Yeah, when we go to the concerts? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, just yeah, we're yeah, using in our is housed. Okay, so a question for either you or Sean. These look like two different kinds of systems. Has there been any demonstrations on how to use them? I believe they're the same system that was bid in both of the packets. Um, no, there's one analog and one IP. Oh, right. Um, so, that's so the IP was the preferred system mm -hmm. uh, because of cabling and compatibility with future telephone systems that are possibly going to be IP based. So that's one of the things that we had said initially when we met with the contractors was that we would prefer an IP-based system, but an analog system could be bid as well. Is IP internet provider? What is IP? Protocol, so it's an internet protocol, and, and I'm not a techie, but basically it means it runs off internet -y wires rather than copper wires. Fiber. Does that mean it's digital? Sure. Cat 6. It's digital. It's right? a Cat 6. six. I saw a Cat yeah, 6 in the digital. Uh, yep. Yep. Which is copper. There is an analog one that's not. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Is, is internet a word? I know. <laughs> I just coined it. I'm sure it is now. I'm pretty sure it is. I think you can add a Y to anything. I totally <laughs> I also want to mention that um, we, we um, brought in the services of Mary Kenseth, who is our the consultant that we use for all of our E-rate and our telephone systems upgrades. She's the one that actually put this RFP together and she's the one that reviewed the, the uh, bids and is um, strongly recommending we go with the CTI. Okay, so from what I'm hearing, CTI has got the features that you wanted to begin with. Mm -hmm. It has the consultant's Approved. recommendation. Yes. And it's the cheapest. Mm -hmm. And they're taking the charge. And they're going to take the charge. So how? Don't worry about getting another contract to do that work. And they said they didn't do it during February, February break. break. Really? Yeah. They Except for the trench. Yeah, they, they, the they, they can do the main building. They can do the, Vermont, right? the center it's school building. Yeah. <laughs> what are they going to do in the February? They're, they're going to do the main building, the center school building in on the February during the February break. And the April break is when they're going to do the trenching in the common school. Good luck. Makes sense. That's got to be a big mess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? Oh, for a draft. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick question. So for, are they going to come in and uh, the support and stuff, if there's issues, they're going to support this too? How long does that last for the life of the installation? I mean, um, I it, would it, would come with, it would come with the, the um, typical with the maintenance, maintenance warranties. Okay. And, yeah. The CTI had nice training. They offered more training mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as well. More hours of... Um, Direct training right on the end. <coughs> is there a backup system if this should get up? Well, right now there is no system. Well, I mean, that this. So, I'm talking, so, right. so it was this drill that identified this? Mm -hmm. No system for the yeah, oh, oh, right. We did. Uh, we started doing you know, some lockdown drills this year, and we started realizing that we were having to um, walkie talkie some people, intercom other people, and then on a separate phone call, the common school to get a lockdown going, or three separate calls, which if there were a real lockdown, 
there just isn't that kind of time. You need it locked down fast. And so once we realized also that there were some spots in the building, like the bathrooms, where you couldn't actually hear the announcement, and in the common school, you couldn't hear it at all, we'd get whoever answered the phone, and they would yell and lock down the building. So, you know, that first lockdown drill, we had um, Roger there from uh, SATEC, he's there at um, SRO, and we debriefed really um, a lot about that, and this just came up as one of those big things that really worried me, and so I started talking to Martha about it, and that's how it happened. Yeah. So, so this may be procedural, but if, if the reason for a lockdown occurs at the common school, can they have a lockdown that locks down the whole Fairfield school? Um, instead of just, you see what this system will lock down anything. This is just a PA yeah. system. This is an announcement. I get that, but they, they can, it's two way. Right? They can announce as well. I think yeah. from any phone or from any, I think it's going to connect to the phone system as well. Okay. But from any location, they can, they can make the all call as well. Thank you. And that's useful. Yes. So as I read this thing, uh, there was a, did you, did you get multiple quotes? It's like one without VOIP cabling and one with. What is that what I'm seeing? Or so we did. Is the intent at the end to have VOIP phones available? We understand that there is a phone project. Right. Yes. We right. don't have the details on that project yet, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that whatever system it was would be compatible with whatever system we end up with with phones as well, with the new phones. So that was that was the that was sort of our criteria when we met with all the contractors who were initially specking out the And it's important the common denominator in all this is Marion Kenson. Because Marion is doing the phone system and also doing the PA. So that's why we trusted her an awful lot in the process. Because she knows what's going on in both places. So it's future ready. Oh I understand. I live and breathe this stuff, but I, I get it. I just saw that there was a thing that said no VOIP cabling. I didn't know if that was like a quote one way and then a quote another, however it goes. But I'm seeing CAT 3 versus CAT 6 being laid. I don't know what you're looking at, but the categories on those wires for the non techies here category 3 is old school, like you'd have in your house. <coughs> category 5, category 6 are faster. Category 5, like 350 megahertz. And, Sixes or sixties around the gigahertz, so it's just about speed. You want that in the building, so you don't bottleneck. Yeah, they've been cat six. I yeah, well, that's what the new standard is anyway. You know, it does like reach back to find it. There is a line where it says 500 foot of cat three, 25 pair. I don't. This is getting into minutia that we don't need to get into, but maybe somebody might want to look at that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what that is. That might have been. I mean, that might have been connecting things in the server room, that type of thing. Well, if you're not ready for it, you're going to need it. If you're not ready for the VOIP, you're going to need it. I just would put Cat 3 down and Cat 6 is just as... Unless it's just a typo. Anyway, we're off course. I'm sorry. <coughs> so now that you open up the question, what is VOIP? Stand Voice over internet yeah. protocol. Uh, thank you. Good to know. So how are we feeling? Ready to vote? Yep. Sure. All right. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Extensions? Okay. Uh, approved. 8 zero. Okay. Item 8D. Announce the tuition rates. <coughs> so, I'm going to hand out these packets, which are the budget packets. And the only reason I'm going to hand out the budget packets now is because on the front page is the information on the tuition rates. So please don't go through the whole packet and give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's give the last page first, please. <laughs> I think I got enough there. smells <laughs> fun. Yeah, well, I just printed them just before it came down. So as those are going around, uh, what we're looking for is the board to announce tuition rates that we can use to bill for for the FY19 school year. The announced tuition rate is just that. It's an announced tuition rate. We can't bill more than the announced tuition rate. 
but we can build less if it's determined that we don't need to build at that, that level. At the end of any fiscal year, all the information is sent to the state regarding all the expenditures and the student counts and population, and they come back with what is called the allowable tuition rate, and that's the amount that the school district is allowed to charge for tuition, and you can either back bill or you have to refund if your announced tuition rate or your billed tuition rate is either higher or lower than the allowed tuition rate. So right now we're just we're looking for, and if we don't do this before January 15th, what happens is the current announced tuition rates are the rates that hold, and we would have to um, use those to build off of for FY19 which would be the FY18 announced rates at this point. So the recommendation is that for the K-6 tuition rate, it would be 11,500. The 712 tuition rate would be 17,500. And the Northwest Tech Center tuition rate would be 12,500 for FY19. Um, I'll make a motion to accept those rates. A second? Or announce them, whatever. Accept them. Okay. I'll second that. Questions for Martha? Can you remind us what they are for FY8B? Uh, yes. <laughs> FY18. Um, darn, I didn't even put those down. The uh, K6, I want to say, is right around the same figure. I want to say it's. Um, I think it's 11,000. The 712 tuition rate is 16,400. And the Northwest Tech Center tuition rate is 13,341. 140. 140. So Tech Center went down. Yep. 7 through 12 went up. Went up, and K6 is K6 about the same. Yeah. Yep. Now, the reasoning for the fluctuations, uh, the Northwest Tech Center, their um, participation has grown, and so they have a higher student count. So when you take this roughly the same cost or even slightly more cost <coughs> divided by a higher number, you have a reduced um, rate to charge by. Um, and the 712 rate um, is going up based on um, our proposed budget and the anticipated enrollment counts. Two questions. Uh -huh. So are these the actual um, tuitions that would be charged an out-of-district student who wanted to attend Correct. these schools? Correct. They would be charged to, this, to, to the school district that they are coming from. So it's not, um, I guess an individual could pay the same price. But. Typically, it's school districts paying these rates. Is, is last meeting, you <laughs> changed the tuition rate for the high school. Last, last meeting, what you did was authorize the business office to bill based on the allowable tuition rates for FY17. The, bill the difference. It's just the high school. Just the high school, because it's the only district that actually had receiving students from seven districts. Mm -hmm. This is the same numbers. These would be the same. And so if I look at the difference between uh, 712, mm -hmm. so math in public is always dangerous, but it looks like about $1,100. Something like that. So is that saying our budget is going to go up? Per pupil, eleven hundred dollars. No, not necessarily those. because it's um, the items that are included in the tuition rate are not your total budget. So special ed costs are not included in your tuition rates. Um, none of the Northwest Tech Center costs are included in the tuition rates. Um, there are only certain revenues that you deduct out of your expenses that go against the tuition rate. So it's not it's not necessarily equivalent to your per pupil spending. Okay. Hang on there because we're gonna talk about it I think in a little bit. Oh yeah. So okay. Um, any other questions or comments about announcing these rates? All right, we have a motion, we have a second. 
Take a vote. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions. Okay. Approved 8 0. Okay, the topic of the evening budget. <laughs> so, if you start looking at the other pages in your packet. So page two and three, this is your first, this is our first draft, are the um, proposed budget for the expenditures. I have on here, I have the FY18 adopted budget, which is what went to the voters. Then the FY18 working budget, which is what we're working with at this point, um, because we have grants that may have come in that we didn't budget for, that, or we, if we did budget for, they may have come in for more or less than what we um, had in the budget. So we adjust the, bu the working budget so we know what we're working with. And then we have our FY19 proposed budget. The um, proposed budget is, at this point, and again, we're not finished. Um, we may still be having some numbers that we need to tweak slightly, but this is our um, best attempt to the first draft, and I think it's fairly close to what we may end up with. It's coming in at $54,529,488, which, which reflects a 3.09% over the FY18 voted budget. People. We'll get to that. <laughs> it's a accounting for the variance between the FY18 working budget and the FY18 adopted budget. What's, is there one big thing? I mean, it's a, it's a, what, a million? Um, no, it could be, it could be multiple things. Uh, most likely it's um, uh, see, uh, consolidated federal grant monies, which at the time that we're budgeting, we don't know how much we're going to receive for federal grants. And so we budget conservative, conservatively for those grant funds. Um, but as we know, when we find out what the grants we have available to us and what we, and we know what we're going to anticipate spending them on, we, we make that adjustment in the working budget column. So it could be that would make sense. many errors. Got more money than you so your expenses would be higher because you're 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 expending more money because you're getting more grant money you're going to spend more in expenses this is just the expense side okay okay the fourth page is the estimated revenues and the same same concept of the FY18 adopted budget is what was presented to the voters. The working budget is adjusted for variances in areas where we have either received more or less in grant funds and or, well, mostly grant funds. And then the third column is, your, is our proposed budget. This is the area where I'm still working through some of the numbers. Um, <laughs> I'm still looking at um, tuition income for the high school, student enrollment information. I'm still gathering that from sending districts. Um, but I'm fairly confident the number won't change drastically from what I've got listed. So basically, you take your total expenditure budget, and you take everything except for that one line item in the middle of the page that says um, education spending, the $39 million. You subtract that the total from your expenses, and that gives you your education spending. Which, right now, our education spending is coming in at about thirty-nine million ninety-eight thousand, which is three point zero two percent over the current year education spending. That figure is important because that's the figure used to figure out your per pupil spending. And that's the number that the governor is asking to be two point five. That's the number that he's asking that when you divide it by your per pupil, that your per pupil spending comes in at 2.5. So he's asking if per pupil spending is, is at 2.5 or less. 
and the next page will show where we're coming in with our per pupil spending at this point. Um, we're coming in at about 3.16 percent per pupil spending with this budget. Um, what you have in front of you is um, a comparison from FY18, which is current year, and FY19. FY19 is on your left-hand side. This is the proposed budget area. Um, again, we're listing the expense budget of the 54 million 529. Our local revenues, which are all those revenues that I've got estimated, at 15 million 431, giving us the education spending of 39 million 98 thousand. Our equalized pupil count for FY19 is 25, 25 2525.57 equalized pupils, which is down by about three, three and a half equalized pupils from last year. Which gives us, you take your 39 million, you divide it, you divide it by your 2500 equalized people to come up with your education spending per equalized people and this is the number that the governor is talking about. We're coming in at 15,481 compared to FY18 at 15,007 dollars per pupil. If you keep going down the, the, the sheet it shows what the um, equalized tax rate would be which would be $1.57.3 and we have our merger incentive of eight cents versus ten cents of last year, which would bring us to a tax rate of a dollar forty-nine. And these are all estimated tax rates because uh, the figures that we haven't got finalized and the legislature doesn't finalize until April, May, June-ish is the yield, which is the um, the figure on number line number nine, the ninety-eight forty-two. That figure fluctuates and that will adjust the tax rate sure. and they will adjust that depending on what they need for income. Is that the 9842, is that last year's or? No, that's the one that they are recommending for us to use at this point. Okay. Last year's was 10,160. The higher the yield, the lower the tax rate. So. And, um, to go a little bit further, I did a little calculation on how the tax rate would be um, presented at each municipality with the CLA adjustment. Um, city would be looking at an estimate of about 72 cent tax rate. Town would be looking at about a 61 cent tax rate. And Fairfield would be looking at a uh, not quite a 22 cent tax rate which if those tax rates were to hold, which we don't know at this point, one, we could be adjusting our budget still yet, we could be adjusting our revenue still yet, we could be, uh, the legislature may change the yield at no, this point, change. and they will change that. Um, we're looking at right now, city having maybe about a two cent tax rate increase, and town and Fairfield less than a penny tax rate increase. Actually, town is almost flat, and Fairfield is slightly more than a half a cent tax rate increase. Okay, so this difference in, in the tax rate, is that after you pull the incentive out or this is the incentives in? In other words... That calculation has the incentive taken into consideration. So, we saw a difference of two cents in the incentive. Mm -hmm. That would pretty much cover what we're seeing as a rise in the city. Mm -hmm. And in Fairfield in time, it's underneath the two cents. Mm -hmm. Right. So, do we have more students? We don't. No. We I'm wondering how we lose <laughs> two cents right off the incentive. I know. We it's, give teachers a raise. It's and all then the math. It's all in the math. Um, you got to give us more than that. Yeah. I, I, I don't. <laughs> and I and, and, and you have to realize that you have to realize that I pulled these numbers together this afternoon. So that's why it's draft all over it. Um, but it's the calculation is that the per pupil spending comes in at fifteen thousand four eighty one and. Um, 
the yield at 98.42 gives us a tax rate of 1.57 cents at this point before the 8 cents. So kind of in perspective on how you look at it, I mean, if you look at the tax rate increase, mm -hmm. it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. If I look at the increase in the cost per pupil, um, a little hard from there. We're at 3%. We're at 3%. Yes. I'm curious as to what two and a half percent would look like. It'd be about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Out of a fifty four either in increase in revenue or decrease in expense. And, and or a combination of the two. But you, you also said that the legislature could change the yield rate. Yes, they could. And I'd probably lower that. Which is what they did last year. I don't know if they will lower it or higher it. <clears throat> don't know. So how actually, in the end, last year they ended up raising it slightly because during budgeting time it was at ten thousand seventy-six dollars and it ended up being ten thousand one sixty. So has the, has the state applied their nine cent increase in education? That's there too. That's in, that's in that's here. That's in here yeah. as well. That's what's amazing. And the. Uh, and the fees for the, the benefits and all that. Because we came, because the governor last year, Jim, help me out here. The, the fees that we pay for going on the, the insurance. That's there too. That's there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. For so, now, is there any chance that the governor is going to turn around and say, if we don't keep this at 2.5%, does anybody know this, that there's going to be some kind of penalty? I, I don't know how there could be, but. Who knows? You never know what the legislature is going to do. I can't, I can't say one way or another. I mean, I don't know if anyone's heard anything. No, I haven't heard anything. Yeah. I, I, I would like to know what the impact of a 2.5% um, raise in the per pupil cost is, because I think um, it, we're Maple Run, right? We're consolidated. We should be doing at least as good as, as other districts around us. Yeah, I agree. So I don't want to you know, shoot ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. But I would like to know what the impact of that is. Um, sounds like, honestly, a, a quarter of a million out of a $54 million budget doesn't sound extreme. I think we could probably work work our numbers more. But how's the rest of the board feel? So are we looking to, to get the, the savings now? Or you're asking Martha to come back what it would look like if we were? Yes. Second? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't expect you to adopt anything tonight. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I just, no, no, I just was wanted to be, all right, yeah, I think that we do need to adopt it before February 7th. So, Jim, yeah, you want to lower the uh, equalized for people, um, the cost for request. The cost for request for people from 15,489 down. I, I, I would, I'd like to know what the impact is. <laughs> I, I think, I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And Martha, you factored in the retirements and places where we were, were not maybe replacing. Yes. Yeah. Great. I think this looks pretty good. I, I think it looks this good. This is very promising. Yeah. It really does. It's nice work. It's all in the back. Also, <laughs> it's all in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Depends what's calculated. Clearly lost my train. <laughs> In the press, there's been a lot of talk about um, employees per pupil. Employees per pupil. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our schools are in pretty good shape. I say that because Kevin told me before the meeting we were. Um, I think the state average is at like four. I, I read and yeah. said if we could move to five, you would save the state 100 million. And I think we're over that. It, Kevin. Depending on the school. Uh, we're anywhere but from the high fours to six. And I, I got that data that I that sort of get to. But then you also shared with me that um, it's not a level playing field because we don't, we don't hire our bus drivers. And, uh, right. Mm -hmm. So that stuff gets contracted out in other districts. It's a, it, as I said to, to Jim, it's a very blunt instrument to use. <clears throat> but it's but used. It's used. It is used. So, okay. So personally, I'd like to see that two and a half percent. 
if anybody else has any comments. You think we should look at two or anything below two and a half just for comparison or context? I don't know. I just throwing it out there. I know. I thought you doing the math. Just two, two, two point five, two and a half. Let's just see how bad it is if it goes. Sure. Yeah. See how much sure the impact is if it goes lower than. Thanks, Melissa. Right. But I, I mean, the real encouraging thing is, um, I mean, basically at city, um, we're treading water because we lost two per two cents in the incentive, and the tax rate went up two cents. And town in Fairfield, it's even better. So. And, and remember, that's including nine cents from the state. That's good. Nine cents. Increase. Right, that they so okay. require. That gets applied through the through the yield. Is that how they yes. put that in? Yep. So that, that could improve. Good. All right, so just so I understand, you want me to come back with what the impact would be if we brought it in at two percent increase in per pupil spending and also at two and a half percent. Right. And when I and when I say impact, I don't necessarily mean that's gonna be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I don't know. That's gonna be we might have to lose a teacher. We might have to cut a program. What real? Yes. What we're going to feel? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else? No. Nice. nice job. Nathan. Yeah, nice job. Thank you. Okay, so now we need to set an information meeting date. So this will be typically hold it the Monday, and, and this is what, what you can decide. The Monday evening before town meeting. Right. Which that worked out really well for us. <laughs> That's where yeah. it so well for us. Town so <laughs> meeting is what, the 6th? Sixth? Sixth. March 6th, yeah. correct. Okay. Well, that's last one. So if you have that here, yes, I do. We play the race. Is there is Jim? Is there any concern about it because it's televised? It won't be out in time for the election. You like, can't yes. have more than ten days before the vote. So. Well, I understand that, but they yeah. can they can like they we just need a couple of days. So. Yeah, absolutely. Typically, what we did is we did it on um, on the board meeting night, night right? But that's because we had to do four of them. In that's you. Right. Mm -hmm. If you went the week before, isn't that the week school's on break? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was always the issue, too. Mm -hmm. No matter when you. <coughs> I know. But I'm just saying, if we do it yeah. March 5th, then it gets, nobody can watch it. Um, if they don't come to the break. Right. And because we know that most of the stuff gets. <coughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't think I've ever had any three visitors. Right. But haven't haven't we also had situations where we've done a televised presentation that was prior to that got placed on cable access? That's what this is. That's what we've done in the past. We've done a presentation that was filmed. That's what, what we said. We usually did it the week before, mm -hmm. so right. they could get on cable. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were still trying to figure out the date of the public meeting, and that is the public meeting. That's the same thing. The, so, night, the night before the vote. I think I know what Mark is saying. There have been times, like when we did the building purchase, that we actually went on to the, we marked it and I did it. Uh, yeah. 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 A special. Dog and pony show. Dog, I watched yes. that. It was good. It was. Which, which we could do if that, if, if that solves the problem. Martha loves being on television. That was really good. It was a nice show. <laughs> Well, if we do but it, we could have the informational meeting any night the week before, yeah. and it could be televised, and then it could be broadcast. I, I, I think it's to everybody's advantage that it gets on the cable TV. It's Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's I mean, and we've got to believe that people are watching that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Fairfield. they're not coming yeah. to the they're, they're not going yeah. to the information. So, could, would it make sense then <laughs> to set that for? Um, Wednesday the 28th, is that, that's not a regular meeting. No, that's not. not. Red Sox play the Pirates. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<clears throat> Wednesday the the twenty eighth of February. Yeah. And is that okay? We're pretty sure Channel Sixteen can get that up in time. Oh yeah. Okay. They're very fast. Are we moving a meeting or is this an addition addition to it? It's an informational meeting. Okay. It's basically just you would come and give a presentation. So we say it's quite the central schedule. Six PM, right, Jim? The early sure? Sorry. 6 p.m. 6 p.m., yes. And then we need to... Where? Where they where? Right. Do you want to have it here, seeing there's no school in session? That'd be... That's probably... The fact that it's at the central office somewhere. Well, like a banner. In the past, the schools have run ads in the um, messenger. Yeah. <coughs> we. You want to watch the time at that meeting? That'd be 6 o'clock, Jack. Okay. 6 to 6 to 6 to 6.04. <laughs> 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 no, because you'd have to write, you have to do your rundown because you're going to have to videotape it. Yeah, six to six oh four. <laughs> okay, so we're set on that. Do we need a motion for that, or we can just do it? Um, I think it says action. Look for a motion. So, so moved. Thank you, Mike. I second it. Yeah. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Extension. 8 0. Item G, warning items. Attachment 7 G. So, Martha. So, <laughs> we have the attachment. Um, yeah, so I think we're missing something. Okay. On Article that's, 6. That's why we need it reviewed. Somewhere I remember in the past. Um, might have been at part back 46 or something else that we actually have to list in the on the ballot what the percent change is in total budget or cost per pupil. I think it's the cost per pupil, which is the second grade. No, that's the spending of blank per equalized pupil. I think we have to list what the difference is the from percentage? the last year. Yeah, I'll have to. Um, I'll verify that. I'm not, it's just, yeah. I think it's in there. And I think we didn't have to do that last year. Right, because, because it was our first year. Because our first year we didn't have anything to compare it to. Exactly. Which is another reason that two and a half would look better than yeah. three. All right, I'll check on that and sure. So grammatically, do you need a comma after the word district in both Article 1 and Article 2? To elect comma at large from the legal voters of Maple Run Unified School District, comma a clerk, yeah. or colon a clerk, or dash a clerk. <laughs> it seems like it shouldn't just be a clerk. So I, I think a comma. I think you're right about the comma. I believe that's a comma. I believe a comma. Oh, and I would trust you. <laughs> oh, do you not trust me? No, not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have teacher after your name, but yeah, well. <laughs> Read a lot of books. We'll put the comments in. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I think it's all around, not just one, two. It's wherever else it's applicable. Yeah, Those par okay, pieces and parts of Article 3. Yeah. Article 4. Mm -hmm. Don't we usually put a statement in there that says something like it doesn't affect us? Taxes? Uh, that's the. That's the. That's on Article Five. Well, I know we do on Article Five, but on Article Four. We can add it. I think so because I mean, yeah. if someone just sees that we want to borrow money, they're going to assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quick 
question on Article 5. This is about the um, capital reserve fund. Mm -hmm. Does this also authorize use of that money, or do you have to go back later and get authorization for use? You don't have to get authorization to use the money. You just need authorization to put the money into a capital reserve. Mm -hmm. And then is this. To get authorization? We used to. They've changed the. Um, yeah. The requirement. You yeah. 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 get the capital yes. reserve, you can spend then it's, then it's the board's discretion to spend the capital yeah. reserve. Right. Okay. Thank you. So will will Fairfield still have a town meeting? They just won't do the budget at the school. Right. Yeah, they'll do the town, right? The town, so. But they'll be able. They'll be building in the gymnasium from seven to seven. So right. Right. So this Australia, Australian ballot covers everybody. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they still have the Australian ballot at town meeting in that whole day. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All set on the warning? All set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Will we adopt that next meeting? Okay. <coughs> okay. On to other business. Warrants. Attachment 8A. Motion to approve the warrant. Second. Second. I'll second that. Discussion, one. question on the warrants? Is there one or two attachments? Two. Two, okay. Two. Okay. Um, I just want to point out, because I always do, get the right one. Our payment to be high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's like <laughs> half a million? Yep. 500,000? Yep. Is that a monthly payment? That's a monthly payment. Well, I'm already you ask right. every month. I, I know, but I'm going to ask next month. Or, <laughs> <laughs> until she changes her answer. It's a lot of people you're insuring. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's going to go up next year? Um, What's the question? 10 19. Yes, it is going up. 10%? Yes. For the gold seed, each, each, each plan is a different percentage increase. 10.2 for the gold seed. Mm -hmm. Another $600,000. And that's in the budget? That's in the budget, yes. Nice. That's part of why the budget is higher. Mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. Any other questions on the warrants? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Extensions? Warrants approved 8-0. Attendance report. Thank you. Okay. Um, there was no attachment today uh, for a couple reasons, which I'll get into. Uh, the biggest being just an announcement. You, you may notice that Kathy is doing minutes today. Um, and um, Brenda is going to be out for a while. Um, she's had some uh, some medical issues that we've been going to be out probably about a month. Uh, everybody else is pitching in and, and taking care of this. Um, but I do want you at least to know that if something is a little slower than normal, um, it might be because we're without bread. Um, but pretty much the whole central office is, is uh, pitching in and taking some responsibility that Brenda did uh, so that the team continues to run smoothly. Uh, one thing Brenda did was the newsletter. So uh, that's why I will be talking about it uh, orally, but you don't, will not have anything written this time. Having said that, I'm kind of excited. Um, 
I, I alluded to this, I think, one other time, but we, um, we're looking to do something a little bit different with the newsletters, uh, starting when Brenda gets back. And um, I think it's a really great thing. We have, we have developed this year a really, what I think, fine, <laughs> collaborative relationship with our, our new district-wide uh, union representatives. Um, Kathy and I meet with them monthly, and um, we're really talking about some positive, good things to move the district forward. And one thing they, they asked if we might do is to do a district-wide newsletter um, that they felt it would be really positive for all staff to know what's going on in the buildings, in all the buildings, so that um, they better have a feeling as, as part of Maple Run instead of their own schools. Yeah, more. And this is my problem. Um, we're going to try that, but we're trying to do it in such a way that doesn't add an extensive amount of new work. So um, we're going to try to, first off, utilize what we're already doing with the, with the newsletter that I put out once a month to you, but it'll be more extensive. And um, I think it's going to be a great idea to get that out there for people to see what's what's going on. I'm going to be working with the leadership team exactly how that will happen, how information will get to Brenda, um, and, and exactly what the newsletter will look like. But, so, so Kevin, can we ask them to contribute to this effort so it all doesn't most fall definitely. on the central office of administration? Most definitely. But in the long run, it's still going to be one person who's going to organize that newsletter and get together. But yes, one part of that is going to be talking to um, the leadership team and talking to the faculty uh, to get information to us. And not only just things like announcements, like there's a concert on such and such a date, but if there's something really great happening in the classroom, it would be great for other people to know about. Um, those type of things. So it could have a good variety of stuff that we can do. So something to, to look forward to um, in February or March, we're going to start doing that. Um, the, the, the only last thing I have, uh, as you know, I'm an officer of the Vermont Sup uh, Superintendents Association, and we have a, what I think is going to be a really important meeting um, next week, the 10th and 11th. It's a combined meeting of the offices of Vermont superintendents and of the Vermont School Board Association, uh, sitting down for a two-day retreat to discuss the, the goings-on that's happening right now with the state, uh, how we're going to handle certain situations. I, to my knowledge, it's never been done. It's, a, it's combined like that. I think this is really crucial and really um, a good thing because uh, VSBA and VSA are both in this together and to have a lot of very intelligent people all around the table um, trying to look at some of these problems and to see what they can do about it and, and to communicate with the appropriate people. I believe Rebecca Holcomb will be there too. Uh, could be very useful. <clears throat> so we're working together. We're never working against each other, but often we're, we're in two different camps and we don't talk. So this, I hope, will be a great time for BSB and BSA to uh, really have that chance to do that. That's all I have. Uh, is that coming up next week? It's coming up next, I think it's next week, the 10th and 11th. Mm -hmm. it's, it's down at uh, at uh, Berlin at the um, Visbet offices. Good time. <laughs> okay, board and administrator handouts. Anything tonight? Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be passing that along as you move on. Is we have one? Move on to the uh, central office administrator reports. Anything else, Martha? Sure.
sure. <laughs> <laughs> so besides me spending my waking hours on the budget in the last probably six weeks, uh, the business office has been busy. They have taken care of and issued the retroactive pay for all the support staff agreement that got finalized and that payment went out before Christmas, which was, I think, appreciated by all the staff. And um, we worked hard to get that to happen that way. The office is now working on gathering the information to issue the W-2s, year-end W-2s, which is <clears throat> A little bit different this year as we are having to issue two sets of W-2s from the old districts for half the year and from the new district for the other half the year and same with 1099s as well for our contractors that we um, contract with um, and other than that you know we're doing our regular day-to-day -day paying those bills those you know insurance bills that are half a million dollars every time we issue the payment <laughs> um, and doing tuition billing and everything else that needs to be done in the business part of the organization. Well, thank you for getting that retro pay out yeah. before Christmas. I'm sure that mm -hmm. meant a lot to the people that got it. So I will tell the staff. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jill, what's going on? I will share out a couple of things that have happened since the, the new year. Um, I know Nilda loves it when I speak about the implicit bias training, yes, but yes. Um, I do have a little follow-up for that today. Great. <laughs> Yesterday, um, uh, Rebecca Haslam came to SATEC, and she did her staff training on the diversity and equity component that I had mentioned that stemmed from the Rowling Conference that we had attended in October. And um, so we continue our work with Rebecca. I think that SATEC enjoyed the experience and the time with her. And based on what that professional development looked like yesterday and the professional development that I attended, we're going to be, with administrators feedback, creating um, what our agenda is going to look like for that implicit biased diversity and equity training for the administrators on February 1st. So that work continues. We're very excited about that. Um, another key note that I did want to mention that I'm very proud of is we've had our second English language learners training for teachers at BFA. That happened yesterday. Barbara Tenney, who is our English language learner teacher, um, and I put together a workshop for 16 teachers at BFA yesterday. It went very well. Um, I was very proud of some of the questions that they asked. I felt like they were very comfortable with the content in terms of admitting what they know and asking questions about things they want to dive deeper in. It's an eight segment series in terms of what that training is. And one of the teachers made a really good point, which was she was um, she took so much away from that experience that she's hoping that this would be more district wide and that other schools will have the opportunity to participate in that training as well. So that's something for us to think about as a leadership team as we move forward. Um, so that was great work and I was really proud of Barbara. I do want to recognize her. It took us a long time to plan even something that feels like just a few short hours, but it was very content heavy. And so thank you to Chris and BFA for allowing us to do that on our professional development day. Um, and next week, this is also very exciting, uh, we are taking a team of teachers to the SF Fitness Gram training down in Castleton. So now under ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, we are looking at students' well-rounded education. And what that means is all students in fourth grade, seventh grade, and 10th grade are gonna be tested in physical fitness. So I will be going in my gym clothes to um, do some of these activities, which terrifies me, but I think uh, it should be an overall good experience, hopefully. Um, and when we come back from that training, we'll be teaching the other PE teachers about what the fitness test is gonna look like that we're piloting in the spring of this year. So those are three things that have happened uh, since we came back yesterday. Um, ESL, that was it. Training was at BFA? Yeah, so that was yesterday afternoon. And that was BFA teachers? It was BFA, yeah, we had 16 teachers attend. How many ESL students do we have? We have third, in the district or just at BFA? Both. So in the district we have 18, <coughs> which has grown, and at BFA there's four ESL students, or ELL students. 
are there are there trends in the state that that's going to increase? I mean, well, I is there anybody studying even, that? Or, well, I would say even just in this past year, if you look at um, how many new students we have, especially with some of the storm damage that happened down in Puerto Rico, we've had new families come since then. Um, and in addition to that, as, as the sprawl of the Burlington, Winooski area continues to grow, I'm sure over the next few years we should brace for um, a variety of students from different backgrounds joining our culture and being a part of our community. So I would say yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Jeff. Kathy. Let's see. Um, uh, this, this time of year, we're working on um, getting all of the documentation on hiring into our files. Um, we had to uh, complete W-4s, I-9s, all of that paperwork on every individual in the district uh, because Maple Home is considered a new employer. Um, that we have finally completed all of that with every single staff member in the district. Um, we are also uh, looking at our procedures with paperwork for hiring and for uh, a lot of things come up, it's interesting, as a, a single district that we come across in HR where we may have had very different procedures at different buildings and we're continuing to look at those because uh, under one contract we need to do different things the same way in all of our buildings. So a lot of things are coming up that um, that we are looking at in terms of procedures and uh, with with our administrative team and with our leadership team so that we can look at I mean, even our procedure for how we uh, charge for facility fees. Those were different in many of our schools. So that's going on, meeting with staff, um, is continuing on uh, training around uh, time clock and uh, a lot of our energy this month is around getting people signed up and enrolled in the, the new health plans and their HSA and HRA. A lot of new learning for folks around handling uh, an HSA and HRA um, and that will continue. We have uh, representatives from Health Equity coming in. They've, they came in in November and December. They're coming back in January because this is the month where people are going to start to have a bill. So they need to figure out how they use their money to take care of. Uh, column movements were all due December 1st. Uh, Grenadier takes care of organizing those and doing the first run through and to file this thick to look through all the documentation for that. Um, and I think in doing a little back of the mix, we really appreciate Brenda. Are you still on item three? <laughs> I'm still on item three. <laughs> well, thank you. Any questions for Kathy? I had a question for both Kathy and Martha. I meant to ask it. for the W twos and W fours. Would that be is that automated or is that still all? Yeah, it is automated. Yes, yeah, okay. it's, it's automated. Mm -hmm. sure. It's a state filing. You're like, oh god, it's still. <laughs> okay, no, well, it's good. Thank you. Julie. So um, December and January are pretty busy. Um, since we met last time, we've had. Um, our child count, which happens every year on December 1st, it's a point in time where every student eligible for special education is counted. They go through a sort, um, and then they spend the next year sending us data out of that. Um, our number this year preliminarily is up again, um, which is not surprising. Uh, two year, I just wanted to look at the numbers from two years ago. Two years ago we had 476 eligible students. Last year we had 521 eligible students. And this year we look to have about 550 eligible students. Our percentage is at about 20% of the total population eligible for special ed. On the coming out of that, um, the other thing we just got, I just got this week, 
was um, the closing of the child count review for last year, where they look at our compliance. And with all of those students and all of their IEPs and all of their evaluations, we have really high compliance. So I just wanted to call attention to the special ed teachers out there and the really good work that they do to make sure that our kids have IEPs that are completed, that are done well, and they're on time, that students are tested and evaluated appropriately. And according to all of the timelines that are very difficult for them, for everyone to keep on top of, um, they do an excellent job. So and I just wanted to, we're, we're, we got congratulated on our high performance in these areas. Just for our reference, what does really high compliance mean? 97.5%. Uh, Sounds pretty high. Wow, that's amazing. Excellent. So that's, of course, we're not allowed to be below 100%, but for, um, nobody's yeah. ever at 100% at any point in time. <laughs> we're pretty darn good. And Ms. Um, Karen Prisco is our Medicaid and Compliance Officer who really works closely with the teachers to say this is coming up, we need to do this. So uh, she keeps us um, on task too. So um, she has a lot to do with making sure that this runs smoothly. Um, next week I will be with Joanne doing our annual training of all special educators on how to properly look at adverse effect, which is part of the special ed process for being eligible for special ed. A few years ago, the legislature, um, they were thinking about opening the special ed rules to, to they, they, I, I don't know why they were feeling that some kids were not getting identified because of the way Vermont's unique in the way that they identify students. Um, and um, so there are some groups that really advocate and say kids are falling through the cracks. I don't, I don't see that in terms of our state numbers, um, which are pretty close in a lot of areas to nationwide trends. Um, but we, instead of opening up the rules, they mandated that every year we give a training so that we really are looking at not just test scores, not just um, basic skill areas, but thinking about kids functioning. So I have to do a training every year. Um, and again, it's a good time to say, we have a high number of kids that are eligible. Let's be flexible. Let's look at the whole student. And let's also make sure that we're really looking at the need for special education and our kids um, just being shunted off to special ed, or are we looking at the whole student and how to support them? It's, it, these are all very complex conversations, and so I think it's good to have an annual training to talk about those issues. It is something to look at every year. What, in your opinion, is driving the number up 20% every year? Are they changing the criteria, or are we getting more kids? I would say that the number, it's, so it's, it's an actual number increase. So last year when we looked at the numbers, there were 40 kids, 40 to 60 kids extra. Um, at least 20 or 30 of those were early childhood children, and we really expected that um, the expansion of pre-K for our all-day programs were reaching more children. So I was actually pleased with that. Uh, I want to reach children early. Um, as a percentage of population, we certainly have an increase in kids who have uh, impact from opiate addiction that are coming into our schools. Um, we have the kids' trauma is not a disability, but the impact of long-term trauma in the life of a child can uh, create disability in children. Um, there, there's, and we also have a lot of low incidence disabilities, which means disabilities that are fairly rare. Um, so the, the, the number of kids with needs are actually going up. It's not how we define how the kids. Right. When we look at some disability categories are diagnosed through looking at academic performance and looking at test scores, like a specific learning disability. We're actually below state average in how many kids we find there. I think we have really good systems to make sure that kids are being caught in good, strong, um, regular ed supported systems. We have high numbers of kiddos who have uh, disabilities that are either medical or um, 
it's, it's more objective than that. Yeah. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. Any other questions for Julie? Thank you, Julie. Jan? So just to dovetail on what Julie was just talking about, that is the body of my work, um, working with the principals in, in the schools regarding <laughs> behavioral challenges and kids who have really high needs. So it encompasses sitting on uh, two of the student support teams, um, both BFA and, and SATEC, meeting on a regular basis with um, with other special educators and with um, Joe and Stacy down at City School. That's a huge part of it. It also dovetails with my work on the local interagency team um, because that is a coordinated effort between um, mental health, our local designated mental health agency, and also the Department of Children and Families. And, and that work is about trying to get some of those needs met um, so that when our students are, are in school, they're able to access their learning. And the other thing that, that we're really um, moving towards a laser focus on is the conversations around building capacity within our schools and building capacity without spending more money. Um, because we have to have the services and we have to have, be able to meet the needs of kids, but we also know that the funding, we're not going to get, the funding's not going up, so we have to be able to, to do that as well. Um, I also just finished, and I can't remember, I don't transition well, and I can't remember what I told you the last time I was here, and I know I missed a meeting. So um, I just want to say that um, I, I finished a, a teaching a grad class on a behavioral intervention. Um, that had participants from Fairfield and SATEC and um, NCSS, and some folks from uh, Grand Isle Supervisory Union. So that's always a, a fun time. And the other, um, I know I'm going to talk about truancy at our next meeting. I'm excited about that. Thank you. Michael, thank you. Um, the other body of my work is we've, we've had a lot as the equity coordinator for the uh, district. We've done uh, quite a bit of work through the fall um, with Heather Lynn and, and training. Um, and uh, been, I've been working on a talk about consistencies of documentation across the schools, trying to develop a, a user-friendly uh, form to document and bullying investigations um, that's user-friendly but also encompasses everything that has been says we need to have learning, and, and that has been a bit of a challenge. Um, but we've had a lot of conversations with folks in, in all the schools. I've had to use the forms that, that I have provided myself, and I have lived the challenges. Um, so hopefully we're going to get some, some movement on that as well. Um, and when that's done, that will be consistent throughout the district. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the intent. Questions? I have a question. You're saying you need to build up capacity with less funding. Um, are you going to be doing that? We're working on the map. It's all in the map. It's all in the map. It's all in the map. We have matching Martha. So I think it's just it's about, it's about looking, looking at um, service delivery and, and looking at supports differently. Um, so just through a different lens um, and maybe some some restructuring if that's possible. I don't know. We're in the creative phase and we're let's say building the road and the traffic going through. So like cross training and additional yes. 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 Um, so, taking back a little bit, I did take Joni's class. <laughs> and it's <a> phenomenal. <laughs> and, um, and, and I would say it's very good. <laughs> yeah, I passed. Is it it's good very good for, good I think, grade? my work with adults as well as with students. Um, a lot of good questioning techniques, a lot of good, like, you, know, you might get upset staff, upset families, upset, you know, anybody. So, um, it was good for me. And it was, it was a good class to take. Um, and then to piggyback a little bit on what Julie said, we are certainly seeing higher numbers in early ed um, for children with special needs. And um, 
not just higher numbers, but higher numbers of children that have significant needs. So we're definitely seeing that go, go up. Um, and we are also trying to be extremely creative with our um, resources and trying to figure out how to meet those needs. And one of, you know, one of our struggles is space. Um, we're, the pro the, it's not a problem. It, it's the reality of early ed is when a child turns three, they become ours. We don't have a cutoff date that puts them to begin serving them the next school year. So if they turn three today, we start serving them today. So we're serving three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and really children that are, I call it their two-year-old year. year. Um, they won't go to kindergarten for three more years, but they're, they're, they're ours. You know, if they turn three on September 1st, we have them in their two-year-old year almost, their two-year-old year for almost a whole year. And then we have to figure out how to creatively serve them with the capacity of, of our staff, um, because sometimes that might mean home visits or visits to child care programs, which is a more intensive service when you think about staff needs um, or staff time but we don't have space for all of them in our classrooms. So um, that is something that we are constantly, we're actually meeting as a team tomorrow to be doing some creative problem solving together. Um, so trying to figure out how to serve some of the kids that have, we have coming in from now until the end of the school year. Um, I'm starting a monthly memo and I haven't had a chance to talk to Kevin about this yet. So I don't know if it'll fit into his newsletter or not. So it might be part of his newsletter, it might be something I do separate, but I have a lot of literature that I read through every month, like that different things that I, it's all early ed, pre-K to grade two focused, so I'm going to start trying to compile that and get that out to the pre-K to grade two staff teaching in all of our buildings and our local child care programs and um, principals and, and other you know, other people. So it may, you may see it separately or it may be part of the newsletter if it fits, but um, it's something I've started to put together. And I did go on December 18th to the state's preschool, it was our first preschool expansion group meeting with all of the grantees. It does look like um, they're still waiting for official guidance from the feds, but it does look like we will get a fifth year of the grant because they have, we have so much um, money in Vermont that we were granted that has not yet been spent. So they're looking at giving us a no cost ex extension for that fifth year. And they're strongly encouraging us to use the creative and how we budget that money to buy things that will last. So, um, and, and to build infrastructure and systems. So, you know, they highly encourage trainings that might be usually a little more unaffordable for us, um, pulling in some high quality people, potentially buying items that will will be here for you know for a, a while into the future um, so we will be looking at that and then the last thing is all of our fall child classroom level um, and program level assessments have been done um, and I'll I'll wait till the spring till we've done our spring and I'll, I'll bring you the data um, at that point that's it questions from Thank you, Michelle. Anybody else? <coughs> Agenda items for the next meeting. Um, Joanne's going to give us a wonderful turn to the corner. Thanks to Mike. Yeah. Thank you. At the request of Michael Malone. <laughs> Make sure it's in the minutes that I request it. <laughs> so the budget, obviously, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the policy. Budget. We got policy E20. We're going to have a uh, principal discussion slash, slash action regarding um, Fairfield Center School principal. Anything else? Could be a full meeting. Okay. Just to clarify, we don't have to for that discussion. We have to, are we going to decide that name whether or not we go out and do a principal search? That's what we're going to discuss. That's what we're going to discuss in the next meeting. Okay. Okay, we have no executive session for tonight. Our agenda is complete, so we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Jack. Happy New Year, all. You too, Al.